dudes and dudettes. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 171. 171, welcome back to the show. Today we have a special guest in the studio. It's not a studio, but we can pretend it's a studio. It's on we Zoom. Can <laughs> we can pretend. So with me today is my uh, frequent collaborator and proud to call my friend Dean Stott, who is the originator, the creator, the head honcho at the DLC Anxiety Worldwide Mental Health Network platform, whatever you want to call that. And uh, Dean and I have been working together now for, oh, I don't know, what do you say, Dean, six, eight months that we've been doing this? Yeah. Thing? Yeah. So if you guys watch The Recovery Room every Friday on Instagram, you've seen me and Dean and Josh Fletcher and Kim Quinlan working together. And so I've had the pleasure to get to know Dean in this time, and we've been talking about podcasting together. So here we go. Episode 171. Dean, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And what an introduction. How how do I follow on from that, Drew? But yeah, it's, so, it's been a... <laughs> It's been a pleasure to uh, getting to know um, you over the last six to eight months. I love everything that you're doing, Drew. Um, and it's a pleasure to be on air and just chat all things mental health. Yeah, we're just going to hang out. And as I usually do with these, we'll just like hang out like we're at a pub somewhere. and We're going to make this up as we go along. But I know that you we talk about this stuff in the recovery room. I know that you have been on an anxiety journey, right? So for those mm -hmm. of you listening, I cannot imagine that you're listening to this and you do not know Dean. I really don't. I mean, my following is so much smaller compared to yours. But so Dean is the founder and creator of DLC Anxiety, which is a giant. Oh, you have a million people in the community now on Instagram. Yeah, um, coming up to 1.1 million, which is crazy. Amazing. Like the bigger it gets, the bigger it gets. You know, that's yeah. how it works, which is so impressive. I have mad respect for what you built over there. But uh, so Dean didn't decide to start DLC anxiety just for the hell of it. It wasn't just a random idea. Clearly, you have experience with this topic. So let's let's take 10, 15 minutes and go through that. What what does your story look like? And then we'll talk about like the mental health online thing in the platform. Yeah, so where do you start? So um I went through it, it was a the, probably the roughest period uh, of my adult life um, where I lost my father. Um he was an inspiration to me, he was really close to me me and like every every male I, I tends to do is they bottle up their emotions and I, I did that after his death I tried to get on with my day-to-day -day living and uh, it cracked up uh, two three four months later um, I developed a panic disorder so I'd be going out into shopping malls shopping centers and just out of nowhere I'd start to have these panic attacks now I didn't know what these panic attacks were I thought I was dying at the time because I'd never experienced the this rush of, uh, rush of emotions, and I literally thought there was something seriously wrong with me. And that, yeah, that uh, went down the spiral of of a panic disorder occurring. I started to fear going to the shopping centres. I started to fear the anxious response itself. Um, so I had a, a really good friend at the time in one of my previous jobs. Uh, he'd actually been through an anxiety disorder and come out on the other side. Um, and he was, he was a, a real pivotal and inspirational and important part to my recovery because everything that I was telling him that I, that I was going through that was so unique to me, I thought that if I was telling people how I was feeling, that they'd think I was crazy, that... That I'm getting all these weird symptoms. Everything I was telling him, he was almost like telling me back, and that he'd been through it. So, it it, it was like he'd like been in my shoes, and he'd come out on the other side. So, as you know, Drew, when you're in the middle of a an anxiety disorder, there's no. It looks like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. You think, you come to the assumption that this is how you're going to be living your life for the for the rest of your life that you're going to be getting up and battling anxiety every day yeah. and uh, um yeah over over a good period of months that that is what my life was but yeah i had this ray of hope from my friend because he'd been through an anxiety disorder come out on the other side so i I went to the doctors. I did all the right things there. They did help because they, um, I remember the first time that um, I went to the doctors, they prescribed me with a library card, uh, which I thought was crazy. Um, I was expecting them to, I don't know, throw some medication at me or um, maybe refer me for some CBT therapy, but she literally prescribed me a library card. Um, so I went out, I was so annoyed at the time. Uh, but I got this book. I, I ended up reading it. It was um, how to deal with um, a panic attack. 
or how to deal with panic disorder. And it, it that really kickstarted my recovery, the psychoeducation behind learning about um, why your heart starts to beat faster, why your breathing starts to increase, um, why all these crazy symptoms are happening and knowing that it's just part of the normal anxious response. So that really kick-started um, my journey to recovery. And over time, um, I learned, um, I did some CBT therapy. Um, I did um, some self-help CBT really and, and decided to do um, flooding. So putting myself into the center of the, uh, the shopping centers and just dealing with the anxious response. So it, it was scary. Um, do you know what I mean? There was times where I felt like I couldn't do it, but by putting myself in the situations over time, what happened was the anxiety started to decrease. And then I could, I could see it was the motivation to carry on. I could see that there was light at the end of the tunnel. And I always had my friends spurring me on and, and the hope knowing that, well, this guy, he, he's, he's, he's 10 years older than me, but he's no different than me. He's been through an anxiety disorder. He's come out the other side, so I can too. And that's where that's where DLC was born, really. I remember being sat on um, a couch with him, uh, just, just chatting as, as we are now. And I was like, this feeling that you're giving me, this feeling of hope of someone who's been through an anxiety disorder, come out the other side, and how I can relate to you. I want to be able to do that on a big scale. I want to be able to really get that message across. And that's where I came up with the idea of DLC anxiety on Instagram, because I knew that people would be able to relate to my story just like I did to him. And it was a snowball effect. Um, yeah, 10,000 followers became 20, came 100. And then we are where we are now, uh, the largest anxiety community in the world. That's amazing. I mean, it's really, really quite astounding to see what you built there. I mean, that is a great story because I, I, I hear two things there. Number one, a real live in-person flesh and blood friend who mm. had lived the experience. And so many people are relegated to, like, they don't, they don't know anybody. They actually mm. don't know anybody has been through it, which is always amazing to me considering the number of people who do go through this. And so, you know, we have no mm. choice but to go online to try and find people who can show us the way. So it was great that you had that, that live living, breathing person in your life. Yeah. And he, he was, uh, he was in like one of my previous jobs and, I think it, I, it almost happened by accident. I had a, a panic attack in my workplace and I think he noticed me and reassured me. And I, I opened up to him and he's like, oh, well, I've been through this. Um, I, and then we, we ended up speaking about it. And like I said, I could really relate to um, everything that he'd been through. And yeah, uh, so my advice to anyone is you don't, you don't be scared of telling other people how you're feeling. Um, we often, we have this inner critic that, that tells us that when we open up that people are going to dismiss it. Um, um, and obviously some people are dismissive, but you have to be able to tell your story and you have to have faith in that other people will be able to re relate and be able to help because that's how the commu our communities thrive, isn't it, Drew? By people sharing the stories, no matter where they are on the journey to recovery. It's them sharing the stories that gives each other hope. Uh, and I think it's, yeah, it's just a beautiful side of, of what can be a toxic place, social media. That, so what we've built in the mental health community, I'm, I'm really proud of not just myself, but obviously platforms like you and, and everyone we work with. Yeah, it's, I think, you know, the stories, when you say people, you know, the stories help us feel that we're not alone. And they can also be stories of inspiration and encouragement and education. So, you know, having somebody who was able to say to you, you know, when you're putting yourself in the middle of that shopping mall, which is so difficult to do, and you're terrified, mm -hmm. having somebody to say, you know, it's okay, I did it too. I know how hard it was, it's going to be okay, like you can do this is so meaningful in a lot of ways. So that storytelling takes on so many different faces, you know, just just knowing that you can commiserate, knowing that you're not alone and knowing that other people are actually doing the work alongside you and people have done it before you and you can stand on their shoulders. So, yeah, yeah, I can relate in a big way. I mean, for me, it was that whole, like I, I stood on the people, the shoulders of the people came before me and now it's my job to give people shoulders to stand on too. So, you know, and I, you've done it on a scale way larger than I ever will. So it's very, very impressive. And I appreciate what you do. So how, how did it get started then? So you come out of the other side of this anxiety disorder, which is always a work in progress. We know that. It's mm -hmm. not like you woke up one morning and said, okay, I'm recovered. Now let's, let's yeah. platform. But how well, did you 
I, I, yeah, I got to the stage of um, I was able to go. So where I was getting panic attacks were, were all the places that I love. So I love shopping. I love going out to the shopping mall. I love like going out to restaurants. And these were all the places that I was getting panic attacks. So it was really having a detrimental impact on, on my day-to-day living. Um, but yeah, being able to flood in the situations what I found um, that really helped with me, and I'm sure you can relate, uh, Drew, is that when I was getting anxious, a lot of the time it's a it's an inner battle, isn't it, with your with your anxious thoughts that are, are going through your mind. But I found that whoever I was with at the time, if I told them, "Hey, listen, I'm feeling anxious at the moment. Um, look, feel my palms are sweaty." Um, firstly, they they never realise, uh, so that they don't know that you're anxious until you tell them. So that, that's the first misconception done because you, you're you often thinking, oh, everyone around me must think, oh, I'm going crazy or something. But that's not the case. 99.9% of the time, people don't even know that you're anxious. But secondly, it was getting, the, getting this um, anxious thoughts from inside me almost out to someone else. And that would reduce the anxiety as well. Um, I can I re- really relate to that with with journaling, for example. Someone's having the, all these anxious, irrational thoughts and putting it out on paper. It's getting it from the mind to somewhere else. But yeah, doing that in a social situation really helped for me. Um, so yeah, I got to the stage where I was able to go back shopping. I was able to go back to restaurants and. That's that's when I really thought, well, I'm in this place of, yeah, anxiety. Once you've been through an anxiety disorder, you know what anxiety is. You're always going to know what anxiety is. Um, so I, 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 I got to the stage where I knew that anxiety recovery was not never feeling anxiety in it again. And I think that's where a lot of people trip up, especially at the start of the recovery. They, they say... The, the amount of questions that, that we get asked is, how do I stop these irrational thoughts? How do I stop these physical symptoms? Anxiety recovery isn't about how do I stop, how do I think? It's how do I accept these thoughts and continue doing what I'm doing? Um, and I got to that stage and that's where I really wanted to, um, yeah, build, build the community. And Instagram just seemed like the best place um I, yeah i was just drawn to instagram there was there was other communities in in other areas like i saw how uh, fitness for example the fitness community could bring people together and and motivate each other and there wasn't really too many accounts at the time doing it um so i saw that there was a gap in the market at the time so yeah oh. I, I i dived in let me ask a silly question. So you were saying that's not a silly question, I guess, but you're saying that, you know, you got used to speaking about it openly in your social situations. So you're out yeah. with, with somebody, you're out with some friends and like, Hey, I'm really anxious right now. Look, my palms are sweaty or I'm shaking or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. You ever get now clearly in a social situation, you're generally with people who you already know they're your friends already, but did you ever get any pushback on that or people who were less than understanding or didn't want to hear it? No, that's a very, very good question. And a lot of people, that's what they're scared of, isn't it? Especially if they're anxious in work, they're scared to say something to their colleague or their boss because they feel that they'll uh, be dismissed. Um, I am trying to think. I remember speaking to someone, um, it was in a workplace, and they said, yeah, thank you so much for telling me, but it's probably best we keep this between ourselves and not tell everyone else. Um, Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately so. Um, that was probably the worst um, comment I've had. Uh, and it really took me back at the time, but it just it motivated me to show that there was so much still needed to do um, in in the awareness of mental health and, and normalizing mental health. Um, because if that situation happened to me in that one place, how many times is that happening every single day across across the world? Yeah, that reaction is like you had told the person that you had bodies buried under your house. Like, oh, don't tell me that. I'll just let's keep it secret. I I promise. Yeah, Yeah. it was a really strange thing because they were they were empathetic and it was almost like they they understood and were. Yeah, they were empathetic towards the the anxiety. But it was, oh, let's just keep it between us. Yeah. I, I'm sure there was no, it doesn't sound like there was any malicious, like, oh, that's it. I don't, well, I'll help you hide your horrible secret. They probably no. they were, 
were helping you and, and trying to keep your interest at home. Yeah, I think so. But you tell anyone about this. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it was probably the wrong thing for them to say, though. <laughs> probably, because like you said, the, most people, so I mean, you know, so many people in the community really, really worry about that. Like people are going to see that I'm anxious. They're going to, I'm going to look foolish. I'm going to embarrass myself. They're going to reject me. So that's a hard thing for an anxious person to hear, like, oh, let's keep the secret. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Especially, as you know, um, especially in a place like a workplace where uh, at the time I was building up to tell the people around me. And then when you tell them, they say, oh, yeah, th th thank you for opening up. And like, if you, if you need to move uh, away from your desk or whatever, just do it. No questions asked, but let's just keep, keep this between us two. So did you have that experience, though, where, where you were able to like, OK, if you need to, you know, take a break, it's OK. So was your workplace generally friendly? No, they were, yeah, um, and it happened over the period of a couple of workplaces. And to be honest, like I said, I, I always tried to be open with them when I when I was uh, dealing with anxiety and come in, come in, like knowing what I know now, I was probably doing the wrong things because I was getting anxious um, at my desk as well. But then I was um, going to a safe place, like going to the men's toilet while the anxious response would. Um, come down and as we know Drew uh, moving away from the situation where the perceived danger is that is just adding uh, fuel to the anxiety so there's no there's no wonder why the anxiety kept coming day in day out because I was doing the wrong thing at the time I can relate that it's funny how the men's room becomes and and many people relate to this like the restroom at work becomes mm. like your escape place is where you're going to go and I, and I was in my early days of the same situation. It would like, that's where I would escape to. And I remember standing there thinking, what am I doing in here? Like, this is, this is, mm. but uh, okay. So then it leads to, you know, the point where clearly it's a clear picture of why you want to start to share this story. And did you start by sharing your story or did you always assume that you would want to let people, other people share their stories? Cause really DLC is, you know, clearly your story is underneath it. It's the foundation, but, but it's everybody's story. Like, yeah, no, yeah. So How DLC and start being about like this community. Was it right yeah, away? No, no, that's a really good question. Um, I started it off by telling my story. I wanted other people because uh, obviously when you start up an account, there's not many people who are interacting with your page. But I knew that even if I get 10 people, even if I get 20 people come to me and say, hey, I can really resonate with what you're going through. Um that I knew that they'd be able to connect uh, and having that connection to to know that they're not alone. I knew that th there was a chance of this um, growing bigger, uh, which is what it did. So, yeah, I was true and I was honest to my own personal story. Now, as as the platform um, got got bigger, um, I realized that I could create a community around this. And that's where that's where I that's that's why i chose to have the logo for example um i didn't want it to make it about me then i wanted it to be a community of everyone sharing the stories me and just me at the like the creator of the platform the founder or whatever but everyone else to be able to share their stories um in an open place in a place that they're not going to be judged and then as it grew bigger and I started making these connections with mental health professionals, um, I came up with the idea of the interviews um, on Instagram because I thought if we can get this free information to the platform, then this, this, is a, this is a real win. So then I started making these connections with mental health professionals and, and I started to create a community, um, not only with the people that were going through it, but with the people who help them people and that's where the the dlc anxiety community is probably is at now um th th that is at the forefront of the community getting the psychoeducation out there getting the interviews with the mental health professionals and and the infographics of of, of the um people being able to relate to symptoms people being able to to relate to certain parts of, of anxiety but yeah, um, I, I, I'm really proud of, of where it's got to. And, and I, I'm just continuing to push and continuing to grow it at the best I can. Well, you're doing a hell of a job, clearly. So keep doing what you're doing. Let, let's talk for a second. And you and I have had some of these conversations offline, right? We, these are things that sometimes we ponder together. And I always appreciate being able to do that with you. The 
have you seen the evolution? Nothing, nothing stays the same. Everything changes and that's life mm -hmm. and that's fine. We should welcome change and evolution and the things are going to, things are going to change in, over time, but the evolution or the change in the tone of that space or how it's used, not necessarily just the DLC platform, but in general, like the difference, I see a difference in the way mental health is portrayed and mental health helping is portrayed on, on social media in the last five or six years. It became to me, it's definitely become a little bit more algorithm driven. It's become a little slicker. It's become a little more well-produced and sometimes for me, and I'm going to, I guess I'm going to ask you questions without making you torpedo your business, of course. So you, if you say, I don't want to answer that. It's totally fine. But for me, it sometimes it looks like, oh, okay, I, I get it. We've discovered that this could be a business. And then like everything else, I understand it's like people who will say, oh man, I saw you two when they were playing a little pub in, you know, in Dublin somewhere. And now look at them. They sold out. Do you feel like the mental health community is in danger of selling out? That's a really good question. Um, and like you say, Instagram in total, so not even the mental health uh, community, Instagram in total is dictated by these wonderful algorithms that we're all competing against. Um, now, with the mental health industry, I can only relate it to myself, so I can only bring it back to DLC. I can't speak for other platforms, but speaking for myself, the, there is certain posts, for example, I know that, are, say, we call it algorithm friendly. Now, I know if I put one of these posts out, it's going to get a lot of traction and it's going to get a lot of people come into my community. That post I may, may, may not 100% agree with. So it may not resonate with my actual journey. But what I know is the, the substance behind the, the 60 um, professional interviews that I have on the platform the the um the voices in the recovery room like yours josh um the, the mental health books like mine and josh like yours and like other people i know that by getting that attention to the community that 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 whole load of good is in there and so it's almost like you, you're competing against the algorithm unfortunately that there is accounts that only do that and then and they may not have the substance within the platform and um, so i think that they run the risk of obviously yeah not being able to provide the resources but yeah i, I think with with myself um, i've managed to get the balance right on that and yeah i'm happy to say that if i'm if i, if I know that there's going to be a post that's going to get a lot of people to my community and then the people are going to be able to resonate with everything, the, the, the real good information that's in there, then I'm going to do that. I, that is an incredibly excellent answer. And I think in the end, people have to realize that like, well, while well, you're living, we're living as creators inside, we're on, we're in their house, we're in their stadium, we're in there, mm -hmm. we're on their field, right? So Instagram slash Facebook, or for YouTuber or whatever platform, a TikTok or whatever you want, you have to live within the rules that that, that, you know, platform is, is set out. And in the end, Instagram is going to reward the things that bring attention. And it's gonna sort of ignore the things that isn't because attention, mm. is the money. So it is a very difficult balancing act to say, well, I, I need to feed the algorithm, because that's what Instagram is here for. And that's what they want. And then I have to balance it with things that might not be so algorithm friendly, but I can slip it into the stream, you know, yeah, just to give an example, our recovery room, for example, I am super proud of, and I know you, Adri, that what we've created it hasn't been done on, on Instagram before, four people in a panel um, connecting with their audiences and sharing our stories. It, it, it's a unique once, once in an Instagram thing that hasn't been done. But when I post our recovery room, it has the worst reach compared to anything yeah, it's the best content. Now, how, like you say, this, this is my, this is my community. This is what I do full time. So how, how would I be able to sustain uh, what I'm doing by just posting the recovery room? So what do I do? I post, um, I could post a, a post that's algorithm friendly to attract people to come and then they view it. So it's a catch 22. Uh, you're always playing catch up with the algorithm. It's always changing, but hey, it's what keeps us on our toes. I know for me, and I don't make a secret of it. I often get very frustrated by it. I admire the fact that you can 
I know you get frustrated too, but at times, but you're, you're good at, at handling that. I get a little vocal about it sometimes. I even know members of our community get frustrated sometimes by what they see and what gets surfaced, but this is, this is what we've been given. So we, we have to make the best of it and use it the best way we can and the most productive mm -hmm. way we can. I, and I, I can see you do that stuff sometimes. Like, I, you know, what's going to bring in the eyeballs and then you could put in the useful content after that. And you know what? We all learn to play that game, me included. As much as yeah. I really against it, I, I, know, I know enough now what, what I should put out before. I can relate because these podcast episodes, when I post a podcast episode on Instagram, it gets the lowest engagement. Mm -hmm. like, this, is a, this is a link to 30 to 40 minutes of like really dense psychoeducation full of experience and knowledge and recovery information but it doesn't nearly get the uh, the attention that some of the other stuff does. Which is, it is crazy, isn't it? But like you say, it's not our reels. And if it was our reels, that's not how we would be writing the reels. Um, we have to, we have to play by them reels. Um, another thing I'd just like to add is that because it's a community as well, um, and especially if going on to the interview, so speaking to me, uh, mental health advocates or mental health professionals, I'm all for, for free speech and I'm all for people having their own opinions. Um, so I may not, just because I have someone on the platform um, who I disagree with, that, that's totally fine uh, because it's now at a stage where I'm able to give everyone a voice and let everyone say what worked for them. Um, and then I I know the users, uh, Jeremy, and I know the clever people. I know that, that what resonates with them, they'll they'll go with, and what doesn't, that they won't use. But giving them as much options as possible, I think, is a healthy thing. I I agree with you, and and I like that you're able to do that. And so, I definitely see it. The DLC platform, there's something for everybody there. Like regardless mm. of what your your you know your approach to this problem is, and and I appreciate that you give people that equal time, and you're at it's fine. You don't have, we don't have to agree with everybody. So you're in a unique position to be able to do that and you do it very well. So thank you very much. Where do we go from here? Like, where do you, what do you think is going to happen next? You know, and we're always on the look like, what is Instagram going to do now? What's the algorithm look like now? What is going on over at YouTube? Like, where do you go from here? Where do you think we're all going to be in another couple of years? Well, it's a very good question, especially with, because this is what we do now, Dre. This is us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's what keeps us on our toes and it's what keeps me motivated. Now we know that Instagram are going through some changes at the moment. We know that they're going to be focusing on video and reels. So short and long-term, long form content. So for the DLC anxiety community, that's perfect. Because if that means that our recovery rooms, for example, get shown to more people, then wow, how amazing is that that the meaning that I can I can really put out the the information that people are craving for, uh, and knowing that it's the best information for them. So I am for for the DLC anxiety community. I'm I am happy about them video changes. Um, the infographics they're, they're not going to go anywhere, but I think over time they may get diluted. It's we're going to have to see, aren't we, when when they bring it into force, um, what happens. But I know there's a lot of people that are unhappy. So we have artists out there that obviously have created businesses with their artwork on Instagram. And uh, they're running the narrative now that um, they're going to be pre uh, preferencing videos and, and reels. Then obviously they're going to be anxious and, and scared about what the future holds for them. But I'm all about adapting, Drew. So I know that the DLC anxiety community will continue to evolve just like it has over the last two and a half years. Uh, we've got the podcast with your lovely voice on. Um, so the, the IGTV lives, we're converting them over to podcasts and hopefully start to see that grow over the next six to 12 months. Um, hopefully start to invest more money and time into YouTube um, but yeah, just staying ahead of the head of the game uh, on Instagram and continuing to to play by whatever the the new reels are. It's a good answer, and you know, it's a, if nothing else, it keeps it interesting, and it's sometimes mm. exciting. I, I know I love the new things. I'm a you know I like to do new stuff, so mm. I think it's going to be kind of exciting, and we'll see where it goes. Um, there's a lot of good people making a lot of good video content already, and it would be it'll be nice to see them maybe have that preferenced a little bit so they get some yeah i'm digging it you know 
All right, we've about th we're 30 minutes in. I don't like to really make it much more than 30 minutes. People have busy lives and they stop by, they give us 30 minutes and I try and let them go. So dude, I appreciate you coming by to uh, spend this half hour. We've been planning it for a while. We finally got a chance to do it, which is great. Mm -hmm. Where can people find you? So yeah, over on Instagram, DLC Anxiety Community. Um, the podcast um, is DLC Live. DLC Anxiety on YouTube, Facebook. We've got Facebook as well under the same name. And the website, um, you can go and access all the links. So www.dlcanxiety.com. We've also got the DLC Anxiety Library coming out, so which is really, really something that i um, really looking forward to, really proud of. So off the success of Untangle Your Anxiety, uh, we're going to have a whole Untangle series on the of psychoeducation books and yeah we're going to have the first anxiety library which i'm really excited about and that we're going to continue to see that grow and hopefully have thousands upon thousands of books in our own anxiety library which would be pretty cool huh it to be great man I, I love the plan i dig it um so all right, guys, if you need to find Dean, not that you're going to have a hard time finding him, but you can go to theanxioustruth.com slash 171. I'll have all Dean's links in the show notes there. And um, thanks for coming by, brother. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you very much, Dre. So as you guys, uh, I'm going to play you out with Afterglow by my buddy Ben Drake, which I do every week. You can find Ben at bendrakemusic.com. And Dean and I are going to ask you a favor. Well, I'm going to ask you a favor. Dean just happens to be on screen with me. If you're listening to the podcast on iTunes or some platform that lets you rate and review the podcast, then leave a five-star review and then take a second and write a review. Five stars with a review is the best way for more people to find the podcast. And that's why I do this. So thanks for coming by. We'll see you guys next week. And remember, this is the way... Makes no difference if you're right or wrong. Now you're on your way.